Hi, I'm Carl. Uh, uh, I work at Chaincode Labs, and I'm going to talk to you guys about software binaries and trust. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy that Ethan talked about what he talked about, because it kind of ties into my talk. Um, so I want all of us to pretend for this talk that uh, everything's perfect, uh, that we have no bugs, there are no CVEs, that you know all, all, all the things that Ethan talked about didn't exist, and we have everything right, right? Basically, imagination, right? Um, I'm here to talk about how even if that is the case, uh, clean source code is not enough. In fact, uh, even with clean source code, we can invoke the worst case bug that he talked about across operating systems and across architectures um, if we do one thing. Uh, so, because we have all of th these things that are in the stack and we have no visibility into basically what we're talking about. And, Hardware is cut off there for a reason. We're not going to talk about hardware today because that's just that's just too worrying for me. Um, so my name is Carl, and I'm here to haunt your dreams. Okay, um, so let, let's talk, let's talk about the first thing. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is uh, runtime dependencies. Um, so Corey mentioned earlier that um, there was an OpenSSL bug uh, in 2008. So I'd like to go into that a little bit more. So it basically started with this Debian maintainer posting on the OpenSSL uh, mailing list asking about, hey, these two lines look like a use after free to val grind. Hey, can, can we just remove it? And after some back and forth, um, they decided to remove it. Uh, and what that caused was this uh, security advisory in 2008 where the OpenSSL package was generating predictable random number generators. And if we just zoom in there a little bit, it says affected keys include SSH keys, OpenVPN keys, you know, all the things that we depend on for our security uh, was affected. And obviously, they didn't do anything wrong. Uh, it's because they had a runtime dependency on OpenSSL that everything went wrong, right? So uh, how do we mitigate this? The, the only way that we, we can do to mitigate this is to minimize and audit runtime dependencies. And sometimes even auditing doesn't work because your build system's also messed up. So all you can do is to minimize the number of dependencies um, that you have, uh, minimize the out of tree dependencies that you have, right? And so the way that we do this in Bitcoin Core is after we run release builds, uh, we run this uh, check symbol script that only allows these libraries. And what you will see is that it's mostly, you know, uh, the dynamic linker and, you know, libc and pthread, your, your, your normal suspects, really. Um, and only Bitcoin Qt has the special font things, but who uses Qt anyways? Um, so, we talked about how clean source code is not enough, and then we talked about you know, auditing dependencies and whatever. I'm gonna tell you uh, auditing dependencies is not enough. So let's go to the second circle of hell, um, build time dependencies. Uh, and I'd like to illustrate this with uh, an incident in 2015 called Xcode Ghost. Um, I don't know if uh, th this might be a little bit um, obscure, um, but uh, basically uh, what happened in tw 2015 is um, th there's this hacker called CoderFun, and he uh, uploaded versions of Xcode to Baidu Yunpan, which is basically China's version of Dropbox. And because sort of the app store is super flaky in China, people usually just go online and it's like Xcode download, and then just downloads the first thing that they find. And he was able to do some SEO optimization to get his link to be the first link. And uh, you know, people downloaded it and compiled their applications. And uh, Basically, uh, he was able to infect some of the largest apps in China, Didi, WeChat, NetEase, which are you know, the equivalents of Uber, WhatsApp, and Spotify, and um, the, the uh, attacker was able to sneak vulnerabilities into these apps with like millions of, like hundreds of millions of users probably. Um, so how do we counter against this in Bitcoin? Um, building releases in Bitcoin, um, how can we make sure that you know, what user download is co corresponds to what is in the code base uh, and isn't going to steal their keys or do something malicious like that. Um, we do this through a, through a process called uh, Gitian reproducible builds. Um, and this, this is a process that's sort of pioneered by the Bitcoin community and was actually adopted by the Tor project for a little while. Um, so the way that Gitian does this um, and is by you know, normalizing the build environment for Bitcoin source code. Uh, if, if this is not clear, the left side is the source code 
the middle is people building it, and the right side is sort of the output, the, the thing that people download as, uh, as Bitcoin, uh, such that you know, it normalizes the environment such that it doesn't matter who builds it, it can be the cat or the dog, um, the source code is going to correspond to the same output. Right? And we'll have bit for bit identical output if we build Bitcoin 0.18, uh, and we'll get the same disk image every time. Right? And so we upload summaries of these build outputs into a repository on GitHub, uh, and we sign these, uh, sign these summaries, and they look, you know, they look something like this, uh, and we call them gitian.assert files, and, you know, um, and it, it might look a little intimidating at first, but it really isn't. Um, here, here is the input. It's just Bitcoin, you know, at this uh, Git tag, uh, and here is the output, which is the disk image with this um, with this hash. Uh, and so, when we have these uploaded onto a repository, um, we compare them uh, against each other. We can't. We, well, we first verify that the signatures are good, and then we compare these summaries against each other. We want to make sure that everything is equal. Everything um, uh, correspond to each other. Uh, so, that, so with this reproducible build uh, system, we know that if something is not equal to, to what other people got, then it means that you know, either that builder is malicious or maybe there's something wrong with their build system. Right? And so uh, this general thing that I've been harping about is called reproducible builds, and it's, it's sort of become a wider movement within the free software community to do reproducible builds. As I said before, Tor has adopted uh, was using uh, Gitian for their reproducible builds for a while. And I think the new version of Debian requires that all new packages be reproducible, which is a, a very good thing to see uh, in this field. OK, uh, so we have reproducibility. Uh, is reproducibility enough? I'm here to tell you that reproducibility is still not enough. Um, and this is sort of clear if you go look at the data cert files, and if you just like scroll down a little bit, um, you'll see that there's you know, quite a long list of dependencies uh, that we still depend on, and, and those are what constitutes uh, our tool chain and our, our, our build environment. And these are basically .deb files that we download from Ubuntu servers uh, that we just have to trust as an, like an opaque blob of things, right? So we have no idea if these are you know, the tools that we expect them to be or something that's going to steal your keys. Right, um, and so let's talk about the uh, the third circle of hell: trusting trust. Um, trusting trust involves um, thinking about where our toolchain and where our build environment comes from. Right, so so where does a toolchain come from? A toolchain is built similarly to a way you know the. the it's, it's similar to how you make yogurt, right? The way you make yogurt is you add milk to some yogurt to make more yogurt, and the way to build a tool chain is you, you give some source code to some tool chain and you make more tool chain, right? And so um, th this, is, this is actually, the, you know, this, this property of tool chains lends it to a very novel attack. Uh, and Ken, Ken Thompson, you know, the person behind Unix, UTF-8, Golang, and you know, everything you love. Um, he, he described this in his uh, 1984 Turing Award lecture um, about this attack called the trusting trust attack, right? So he described how because tool chains are built by older versions of themselves, you can just poison an entire line of tool chains by poisoning one generation of a tool chain, right? And it would just propagate down to future generations, even if the source code is good. As you can see, it's green, so it's good. Um, and so what that means is that uh, we can be reproducible with Gitian, right? Um, but if the tool chain that we download from Ubuntu or from Red Hat or from Apple is malicious, then what we have is a reproducible system that is reproducibly malicious, right? So we're reproducible, but we're reproducibly malicious. And so what can we do about this, right? What can we do about the fact that our tool chain consists of countless trusted binaries uh, that can be reproducibly malicious and the possibility of a trusting trust attack propagating it down our chain and, and us having no visibility into it whatsoever uh, well, we need to be more than reproducible. We need to be uh, bootstrappable, and that's a long word with a lot of syllables. So, you know, what does that even mean? 
Um, being bootstrappable means that we can't have that many opaque, um, you know, binary tools that we trust to be downloaded from this third-party server that can change it at any time. It means that we need to know how these tools are built, and we need to be able to reproduce these tools from, you know, a minimal set, uh, preferably a minimal set of trusted binaries, right? So, in other words, we need to minimize our trusted set of binaries. Uh, and maintain an easily auditable bootstrap path from these binaries into the tool chain that we use to build Bitcoin. And this allows us to you know, minimize trust and maximize verification. Okay, uh, so how do we do this? How do we ensure that the users are you know, running what we intend? I believe the way forward is by using um, functional, uh, functional package managers like Geeks. Um, and Geeks is a lot like Nix, if you, uh, if you guys know about that. So it's a, it's a package manager where you know, bootstrappability and auditability is a, are fundamental tenets, right? Uh, what it does is, as a functional package manager, every binary output Geeks produce, it's a pure function of the source code and the tool chain used to produce it, right? Meaning that every single package that Geeks builds can be traced back to a set of, um, to a minimal set of trusted binaries. Um, and so let me show you what that means by, you know, there's this heady command called Geeks Graph, uh, and, uh, you know, we can invoke it on a package, let's say bash, and it'll give us its dependencies, and if you give it a few more flags, it'll give, us, give you more dependencies, and if you give it all the flags, it'll give you all the dependencies. Uh, and this is, a, this, is, this is a complete graph of all the dependencies that is needed to run and build Bash, which is incredible in and of itself. Uh, but if we scroll down here, uh, you can see that there are some things that are uh, suffixed by bootstrap. And so this is the minimal set of uh, bootstrap binaries. And I just cleaned it up a little here. So here's the bottom part of the graph, right? Uh, so in Geeks, Every single package's dependency tree has this at, at its root, and every single node here that's a sync, those are uh, its bootstrap binaries uh, that it depends on. Um, so for a little bit of comparison, and you know, uh, not, not to shit on Debian, they do a great job. Um, in, in Debian, uh, they've been having this problem of dependency hell, where um, in their dependency tree, uh, they have a, <laughs> They have, a, they have a, a, a strongly connected component of 2,000 plus packages um, that's, that's, that's been around since uh, 2013, and uh, it's, it's really just only grown since then. Um, so so th those are sort of the advantages uh, of Geeks, right? So what does this mean for our tool chain with Geeks? It means that you know, if we use Geeks to build our tool chain, we can, ha we can audit where, how our tool chain was built. We can easily bootstrap our tool chain from, our, from a, a you know, trusted set of minimal uh, uh, binaries, um, minimal set of trusted binaries. Um, uh, which is in stark contrast to uh, if we were still using Gideon and we were trusting our downloads from servers that can be down or modified or compromised at any time. Um, and so, you know, these unique prop properties of Geeks is why I think, you know, the Software Heritage Foundation was like, hey, let's just let's use it for our long-term reproducibility project. Uh, why it was like one of the first package managers to uh, bootstrap Rust. Shout out to Rust. Um, and, uh, and obviously, uh, there, there, there are uh, scientific institutions around the world trying to use it for reproducible scientific workflows. Um, and so the, the interesting things that are happening in this space is, um, are, are, in further, uh, are furthering the effort in making the uh, tr uh, minimal set of trusted binaries even smaller. Uh, so right now it is 232 megabytes, which sounds like a lot, but it's already a fraction uh, of that of um, uh, Debian's. Um, uh, on co the core updates branch right now, we have um, this bootstrap method, method called MESS, which brings everything down to 131 megabytes. Uh, and at the end of the day, I, uh, what we'll ho hopefully do is incorporate this project called uh, stage zero or hex zero, which would actually, you know, actually bring it down to about 357 bytes or so, uh, depending on the architecture. Uh, and we, we would be, uh, all, all we'd have to do is just look at these 357 bytes, uh, easily auditable, fully commented, um, you know, uh, x86 or, you know, whatever assembly code that is. Um, and and we, we'd be able to um, bootstrap the whole, whole world. So 